Um, I don't want to waste any time because I am so excited about this conversation, and I know you guys are all very excited, too. We have so much to talk about. Let's bring out these icons, Ted Danson and Mary Steenburgen. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Uh, Pretty this is a nice, a nice little uh, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to start. We we had a had a little cheers moment last night. Ted, how was it for you? How was how do you feel now? It, it was the best experience. We don't hang out together. Life takes you in so many different directions, and to be able to hang out, reminisce over a time that was clearly emotional for all of us mm -hmm. you know uh, yeah. jimmy burroughs teared up at the end he oh. was it was so sweet anyway yeah. thank you all for being here <laughs> um i want to go back a little to when when you guys first met and first started working together 30 years ago uh what was your initial reactions to meeting each other when you when you first met the, the cleaned up version sure <laughs> No, we don't need to clean anything we, up here. We had met three times in LA over the years, married to different people, hi, how are you, kind of thing. Um, and uh, then we got cast in the same movie together. We won't mention the name. Um, yeah, because there is no IMDb or... Oh, good point. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I'm going to just start it, and you can finish it. But um, I, well, here's here's my first. Was we uh, Mary calls it a what was it when you flew out and it was a it's, compatibility. Thing. Yeah, it was to see. It's it never is fly the man in to see if the woman likes him enough. It used to be like a chemistry test, and it was it. It was in the guise of a dinner, but I knew that if there wasn't a chemistry thing, that the part would not be mine. Mm. And that I think that's gotten a little bit better, but it was just an annoying thing that women had <laughs> to go through. Anyway, go on. So, <laughs> I just heard that you weren't really attracted to me. That was just... <laughs> But I remember that we were first sitting opposite her and sit Mary and saying to myself, oh my, I have an excuse to look at her because we're about to work together. And so it wasn't that shy kind of normal social meeting or something. I could just soak her up and I was blown away by you. Aww. It's very nice. That's so much nicer than what I'm going to say. <laughs> Because I had been up for 48 hours straight. I probably longer than that in some ways because I'd broken up with my boyfriend of four years and it was like trauma plus. Then, but I was shooting a film in North Carolina and I was asked at the end of almost like a 18 hour shoot to be the best, to be the uh, maid of honor for the editor and the script supervisor who are getting married. And so we, at the end of this crazy long day, we had a wedding and then I had to go back and pack and fly across the country to San Francisco to see if I got along with him. <laughs> and and um, so, I get there and I'm like, I can't even believe how bleary-eyed I am. <laughs> but I like try to pull it together. And we go, uh, it was a restaurant. Uh, I don't remember the name and I bet you don't the either. The famous but... guy in LA pizza, uh, anyway, go on. <laughs> but famous anyway, restaurant. Yeah. Um, and so we go to this restaurant and Ted's waiting uh, and greets me in this sort of bar area and he has hair down to here. And I'm like, oh, wow, your hair is so long. And, 
and he goes, oh, it's this thing called extensions, look. And he starts showing me. <laughs> and he shows me these things, you know. And, um, and he said, it's for this movie I'm doing, which was Getting Even with Dad. And I had just left Kieran Culkin, whose mother I was playing, and he was playing Max. Max's dad. And so, anyway, uh, he was very... And I was thrilled. He was I so was thrilled so with that hair. It, he, he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't care that it started out on somebody else's head. And he... Um, so he... He leads me to the table, and he's this amazing tall guy, but he's tossing the fake hair. And, and my first impression of my future husband, really, was this is the most ridiculous creature I've ever met. Get him laughing. And they're yours. But 30 years later, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Was there, I want to skip ahead a little bit, was there a time after you guys got into a relationship that you had a conversation that you were going to continue working together? Because that's very rare that we see that multiple times, and you guys have done it so many times so successfully. Like, did you have the conversation, like, let's keep working together? I, I, I don't know if it was a conversation, it was just the desire to be together and not let, in the, especially in the beginning, and um, to be going off in separate directions while we were also blending our family. We both brought two kids each together, so it was four teenagers and a new beginning. So I think there was a, an attempt, whether it was spoken or not, to work together w whenever we could. Yeah, let's repeat four teenagers at once. <laughs> it was, it, we needed to be home as yeah. much as possible. Yeah, completely. Yeah. How much of each other's work had you guys watched before? Say again. How much of each other's work had you guys been familiar with? I knew uh, two or three of Mary, I, movies, and I was a full, when I heard that she was interested in be, doing the movie we did together, I was like, I was, you know, thrilled because I was a huge fan. But uh, one of my favorite ones was uh, uh, Time After Time mm -hmm. uh, with Malcolm McDowell, who's the father of my stepchildren. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, going south. Mm -hmm. I didn't see right away your Oscar film, uh, Melvin and Howard, until later. But anyway. What about you? I Not so much. <laughs> that is not true. That is not true at all. I was a massive Cheers fan. I was a, a huge, never miss an episode, loved it, thought it was the most brilliant writing, brilliant directing, and most perfectly cast cast mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. It was just every single one of them inhabited those roles and... Um, I just, I thought it was brilliant. And um, then when I was going through my divorce and, and it was around the same time I lost my, I lost my dad when I was making parenthood. I was actually flying back and forth between uh, Orlando where we shot that film and, and North Little Rock where I grew up in Arkansas. And it was, you know, I adored my father, and it was a very heartbreaking time in my life, and I felt like a little rudderless, you know, and uh, that was around the time that Cheers came on every night, um, but around 10 o'clock or something, I don't remember exactly, but it was after I'd gotten my kids to bed, and I would go in there and watch Cheers, and I never, as much as I, I thought about him from the point of view of just respect for his craft, like how, you know, I didn't have like a great big crush on him. <laughs> but I do now, I do now. <laughs> um, um, and uh, began too quickly when we started working together. It was like, 
we'd all, the cast would all go places to lunch or dinner, and then sometimes he wouldn't be there. And I was like, oh, it was more fun when Ted was here. And it was like, it snuck up on me like that. But um, yeah, I was, I was just a huge, huge Cheers fan. I also loved him in Body Heat. I thought he was so great as the tap dancing guy mm -hmm. in Body Heat. And if you haven't seen that, you should watch that film. It's a really... 40, 45 years ago. You'll, you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think 30 years into marriage, if you have a crush on your husband still, that's a great I sign. Do. I think that I is do. very oh, rare. We're holding back because we're <laughs> yeah. nauseating the... <laughs> Please don't hold back for us. Yeah, our children would say, let them hold back, it's sickening. <laughs> well, I, I wanna talk about that. I mean, it, it's not, we're, you guys are in an industry that it is very hard to have a relationship that's successful and have a career that's successful. Not only do you guys do that together, but you also do that separately. You both have very successful separate careers. What is the secret to balancing all of this together? Well, we came, found each other, in my case, late in life. I was 45, and by then, you have made a lot of mistakes and learned, but it wasn't, you know, I think we came with a realization of how blessed we were to have found each other. Uh, and everything after that, the figuring out kids and careers and everything, uh, was easy because we knew what was the most important thing. Do you still have Pop that. Oh, sorry. I have allergies. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but especially to, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, wait, the secret to it, I have to give credit. We, we have two assistants that, one of him has been with us for 20 years, wow. and, and she's a big reason that we can do everything we do. But... Pretty much the family came first. That That's just, we're so in love with our kids, and now, of course, with our three granddaughters. And that, that kind of ruled everything. And if Ted and I are alone, we're either talking about how much we love our dog, Arthur, who's 17 and a half. Yeah. And, um, and or, how much we love our home, and uh, and uh, or not necessarily last, but how much we love our kids, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and first of all, probably how much we love our grandkids. Mm -hmm. So we're not constantly talking about work, but when we do talk about work, I'm I'm just saying a lot of things you didn't even ask me. Now this I'm on a I'm Office. on a tear, but. <clears throat> when we do talk about work, it's very nerdy because we both studied in New York around the same time and we both studied um, Meisner technique and I was lucky enough to study with Sandy Meisner and Ted studied with a very great teacher, Wynn Hanman, who also taught that technique. So it's not that we always talk about the Meisner technique, but we do talk about acting in a sort of nerdy way, because we still adore it. Yeah, love that. Well, we are thrilled that you guys still adore it. Let's just say that. <laughs> uh, when you guys have worked together, what, I guess looking back, what is the, your favorite thing you've done together? Because there's been a lot. And I think back to like Curb Your Enthusiasm work, because it's work seemed wise. Like a while. Work wise. Wow. Uh, well, no, I mean, we can talk about what you, what's the favorite yeah. thing you've done together in your normal life, too. <laughs> Just well, we'll give sure. you a choice. We'll give you a choice. Uh, Gulliver's Travels or Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. They both were fun to do together. Yeah. I mean, Curb is fun in that Larry is our crazy friend, and it really doesn't feel like work. It's just, and, and also there's no script. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't feel like work, and it's just going and playing with that funny person. Yeah. And Which so, I always think is a little weird that he gets nominated for best writing. <laughs> uh, now, when you're looking back, is there one of the roles you guys have done together that you'd want to revisit? 
uh, probably not in that. We seem to be looking that way more than that way. Yeah. You know, maybe there'll be a time, but we're now still very excited about and what's th around the corner. I think yeah. we also do love working separately because the other person gets to experience, like, you know, like everybody in the good place came over and we had um, a slumber party, you know, and, and, um, I wasn't even around in his life when Cheers was made, but I, you know, I love those guys. Mm -hmm. And I, we've been, you know, um, and Woody's an amazing friend. And it, it, it feels like even though some, most of our career we're working separately, mm -hmm. um, but the other person is so included in that beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. Last man on earth. We, we, yeah. have, we, we party with the same group of last man on earth cast for they, years. They and come to my 98 year old aunt's birthday party in <laughs> Arkansas. <laughs> They get on two planes to get to Arkansas to be there. I mean, it, we're really close, and yeah. um, so it's also nice to take turns taking care of the other person who's out the door <laughs> at five in the morning. Yeah. You know, if you're both doing that, it's I'm tired. No, I'm tired. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. This yeah. way, it's kind of handy. Do you guys have those kind of conversations when you're going out for a role? When you're figuring out what's next career-wise? Like, okay, well, maybe if you're going out, maybe I'll I'll sit sit this one out, like not take this on and take turns, or is it more just depending on? I think it's just the way it happens, yeah. really. Also, I would never be capable of denying him, and I don't think he would me, the the gift of a great experience or a great project mm -hmm. that I wouldn't, I couldn't live with myself, but it, it has kind of gracefully worked out to where, you know, I. I did a show in Vancouver, um, and Todd was up there as much as possible, uh, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, and he would come up and, and thank you. Um, and that was tricky because we started that, we did one year of it, and then the second year of it was right after, it, it's in the, uh, late spring of 2020 and I didn't have any friends to call to say what is it like to shoot in COVID and man was it weird it was yeah. especially at that point there was no relaxation about it and they were it was everything was topsy-turvy and um, come be be childlike and inventive and creative and be careful you could die <laughs> Yeah, that's fun. That's a fun experience. <laughs> well, you guys are obviously people really, really love listening to you talk about your careers and your regular life. Would you ever let the cameras in on your normal life at home? I don't think so. No, thank you. <laughs> you're like, this is it. This is what you're getting here, right here. Well, we prize it too much and... Uh, it may, be, it may be kind of boring for all of you. It might be a little bit like, uh, oh, wow, is that it? <laughs> but no, I think, we, I think we just... They're watching Love is Blind together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Korean, uh, Korean rom-coms. Whoa. Big in our house. We love both of those. Big in our Crash house. Crash landing on you. Crash landing on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, I don't think anyone in here would be bored watching you guys watch Love is Blind. Let's be honest. I mean, that sounds like a fun show to me. Call on oh Netflix my God. after this. Our oh oldest my. daughter actually filmed him. Uh, <laughs> Which the, show was it? This the was Bachelor. Mean. It was the I think bachelor. it was The Bachelor. I was just watching it to keep her company. And. <laughs> And it was like the last thing, and and he didn't know she was filming, and he's <laughs> he's all involved deeply. <laughs> oh my goodness! I was getting, one of my questions was obviously because we're at a TV festival and we all in this room love TV. What it is that you guys do watch, whether it's separate or alone? What is your go-to shows that you guys watch that are uh, the on most recent? Older? Succession. Succession. Was, uh, 
my God. Amazing. Of course. Speaking of Kieran Culkin, who yeah. was just, I was just blown away knowing someone as a child and then watching that extraordinary performance. But it, they were all brilliant and the writing was so brilliant and and it kept us guessing you know yeah. throughout but you felt like you really did enter a family that was so weird and rarefied and mm -hmm. so unlike our family mm -hmm. you know and but it was magnificent yeah we're enjoying the heck out of Ted Lasso mm -hmm. yes <laughs> yeah I think I it's, heard I heard George say godson. No, but he then he said my nephew. Yeah, he's so, just godson. Yeah, Jason Anna. is George Wentz's nephew. So pretty cool. A small world. Yeah, and Jason is also in Last Man on Earth. He plays mm -hmm. um, uh, the Will's. brother Will Forte's brother. Yeah. Successful um, astronaut. Astronaut right? brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? project of each other's has made you guys laugh the most? Say again? What project of each other's has made you guys laugh the most? Oh, cheers, probably. Well, I love a show he did called Bored to Death, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love that show. I, love, I loved the writing. I loved the relationship with Zach Galifianakis and Jason Schwartzman and Ted's character, <laughs> stoner, elegant, rich, bored, New York <laughs> stoner. It was just. <laughs> did, did she mention stoner? Did I mention that you're a stoner? <laughs> hey, we had the privilege. Uh, we've recently met in the last year and, and become great buddies with Phil and Monica Rosenthal. And he does, he has, they have this uh, movie night every Sunday and they invite whoever's in the movie to come so that they can talk about the experience. And we got to see Melvin and Howard that Mary won an Academy Award for. And it wasn't like funny, funny. It was the best kind of delicious funny. It was just su such a perfect performance. And I really encourage you to try to find Melvin and Howard. It is brilliant, just brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I just want to let you guys know, toward the end, I will be throwing to audience questions, so start thinking of them if you, if you have some. Um, when you guys look back, what is the thing you're proudest of? I, I know you're going to say your kids and your grandkids, so let's not say that, because that's the, <laughs> that's the one we all know. We know that that's going to be it, and your dog. Um, but what is the thing you're most proud of in your careers, each of you? I, this is Pollyannish, sorry, uh, not Pollyannish. This is the truth, and it's not really ask, answering your question, but we both love the tribe that we belong to. We both love actors and writers and directors. We both love going through studio gates. We both love work. Um, that's what I respect most about both of us. We both love our, and feel blessed to be in this field that we're in. And, uh, and I think it's why we still get to work, to be honest. I have, my dad was a freight train conductor, and um, it was a hard job, but he did it with such um, gratitude, and he was so good at it. and. When I, I remember being scared to tell him my dream that I was going to go to New York and go to this place called the Neighborhood Playhouse. In fact, I'd already been accepted into it before I got up the nerve to tell him. We were sitting, it was very filmic. We were sitting in our backyard in Arkansas on these little lawn chairs and the air conditioning unit would go on and off. And when the air conditioning unit was on, it was too loud to really have the conversation. So it would go off and I would go, okay, tell him, tell him. And then I would get tongue tied. And anyway, eventually I said, daddy, I, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I want to go to New York City and I want to study to be an actor. And I, you know, it was like saying, 
I want to go to the moon. I know I have no astronaut training, but I'm pretty sure I'll be fine. And, it, you know, we were not people who had traveled, you know. We just, um, he, bless his heart, he went from North Little Rock to Poplar Bluff, Missouri, back and forth and back and forth. That was his run. And so it was a really big deal. And he just was so supportive, and so was my mother, about this crazy dream. And I really felt like from the time I went there and studied and waitressed for six and a half years or so, I just felt like um, I owe them to work as hard as I can at this and to work as hard as they do at their jobs. And so I kind of just always have felt a work ethic about what we do and it, and it, it it's good because when I work with younger people, they see that I don't come in late. And I do think it's important to know my lines. And I just got through doing my second film with Jane Fonda, Candace Bergen, Tyne Keaton. So, um, and everybody said to me, um, who's going to be the diva? Who's going to be the troublemaker? And my answer is like, they are three extraordinary pros. They're absolutely, you know, you have to beat Jane Fonda to the car in the morning out of the hotel to, to, to beat her to work because she'll be the first one there. And, um, and it's, it, to me, that's the thing I'm proudest of is that it, it might not have been as hard as what my dad did physically, but it's, it's something I applied my effort to in every way. Yeah, absolutely. Give it up for I think um, something that we've talked a lot about this year at ATX is how the industry has changed. Of course, we're in the middle of a strike. We're in the middle of a lot of changes happening in the industry. But for you guys who have been in this world for a good amount of time where you've seen that shift in TV, what is the biggest thing you've learned during that shift of how, how especially how comedy and sitcoms have changed to where you are now? Uh, what, the last part? How it shifted. Comedy and sitcoms have changed as well, but it's, as well as the whole TV industry. And I am wearing my hearing aid. I was going to ask you, but then I decided that would be rude. <laughs> <laughs> Um, wow. Go grab your mic. What do you think? You want to go? No, you go, because I just yak. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll yak. Um, well, the obvious, you know, when we started out, when I started out in television, there were three networks, mm -hmm. you know, and that was your choice. And then Fox came along, four networks. And so, um, and cable hadn't come, and... So it was easier, in a way, to get shows out there and get them watched by a lot of people. And that status quo felt very, um, had structure that you could depend on. You'd work for nine months, you'd do 22, 24 episodes, you'd go on summer break with your kids and you'd come back and do that. And then cable came along and um, all of a sudden, the TV that you were watching, they, they brought a cinematic kind of feel to it. You weren't just watching TV, you were watching movie-like sh TV shows on HBO or whatever. And that kind of started to pull, I think, the audience away from the, the more vaudevillian or whatever you would call half-hour sitcoms. Uh, people were expecting to see, because it was one camera and it was film, they wanted to see something that was film-like. Um, then Larry David came along and fucked everything up. <laughs> it was like, all of a sudden, sitcoms were like on acid. Um, and then that just took off, and now you have streaming. So everything, and streaming's a little bit, we're in the middle of a strike, and I think it's okay to say this, but streaming is a little bit, it did to television what, I don't know if it was Spotify or who did what first to music that demonetized it. All of a sudden you could download load things for free, and it became the kind of wild west. And I think that's where we are now. Uh, 
everyone's scrambling to figure out how you can still make a living in this world of streaming where now there are no uh, residuals, there are no, you don't do, uh, what do you call it, um, reruns, okay. you know, and it's all developed in a way to maximize, maximize the money for the studio, as it were, or the network, the streaming service. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's the business model, but I think also people expect now when they turn on TV that they, you know, you you can look at Succession and it's like some of the best writing in the world and it looks like some of the best films ever shot, and so people expect that more. Um, but the acting is still the acting. I think I don't think that's changed for us. But the business model and what people expect, I think, has changed. Also, I, I, that's the, he's right about the structure of all that, but the experience for us as actors is the world we entered in the late 70s in Los Angeles, if you entered that and you were lucky enough, somebody like me who my first job was lead in a movie opposite Jack Nicholson. So it was, it was crazy. Who was the world's was, biggest star. Yeah. He, he had done Cuckoo's Nest and won Oscars and all this stuff. And so at that time, people literally said to me, oh, you can't do TV. You, you mustn't do TV. Because in those days, doing TV was a step down or a step backward. And then I honestly think that Cheers and uh, All in the Family and those shows like that that were um, important shows, The Cosby Show, um, were, were, they changed the quality of television. There are others, obviously, I'm leaving out, but, but it started to be fantastic to be on television. And it, it took a while, and it was weird, the difference. I, I remember an agent telling me, oh, you mustn't, because I was tempted to do something on television. I said, you mustn't do that. It was like, I didn't like being told I, <laughs> where I could only go, you know? So yeah. I like this better. It's quality is quality. Yeah, 100%. I like to watch my friend Woody Harrelson's movies, especially if they're really good. <laughs> yeah, we can I tell. I like to watch them on my cell phone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the way they were intended to be watched, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you should just say what you and Woody are up to. Yes, yes you should. Yes. Um, fingers crossed, meaning um, Woody's a little bit of a loose cannon. And, um, <laughs> but we're doing a podcast. Woo! It's going to be... Um, you, won't, you won't find it out there until about October because he's making a film right now. <clears throat> um, no, sorry. Um, and we're going to celebrate you know, cheers, our memories, and we don't really know each other after 30 years of not being together every day, mm -hmm. and so we're catching up with each other, and I'm meeting his friends, he's meeting mine that we've worked with, and the truth is we're having a ball, so it'll probably happen. Anyway, That there is you are. so exciting. <laughs> are, you, are you guys podcast listeners? Do either of you listen to podcasts? I'm more scrambling more. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of great ones out there. Yeah, so now yeah. you can now you can just freshen up on it. Um, one of the things I I was obviously nervous to do this conversation because these are two of the most iconic actors and comedians and I mean musically also oof, a goddess. Uh, I needed, but I, you know everyone was like, oh, they're two of the most respectful people ever. They you don't you don't have anything to worry about. And I've noticed at the moment we met that the professionalism and respectfulness that you both have, and for people that are in this industry, know that that's not always the case, unfortunately. So my question is for you, what advice you have for people who are getting started in this industry of how to keep that down to earth and respectful attitude toward people while you're also growing your careers? Well, I think you said it. I mean, um, I think, you know, if, if people come up because they've fallen in love with the craft of acting and they study and they go to school and they do all of that, as opposed to coming up because they want to be famous, 
you know, I think that's the difference. Because if you fall in love with the craft, then you know that the play is the thing, not you, but the ensemble, or you fulfilling the writer's you know, imagination and dreams, and, and you are part of that, and you don't put yourself in front of it. I, some of the most famous, brilliant actors sometimes can get to the point where you see their ambition in with the character, you know, and it's kind of like, wait till you see this moment, you know, and the moments are great, but you're not watching the character anymore, you're watching the actor. And so I think as long as you've been trained, I think you don't even, that's not even a question. Of course you'll be respectful to everybody in the process. This is a community. You can't do this on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody there from craft service, especially craft service, um, <laughs> is important, you know? So I think that's how we came up and so that's how we feel. And it's just common sense, you know? They're your audience. They're, they're you're together for 15 hours a day. Uh, you be respectful, of course, you know. So you're infinitely replaceable because you're yeah. trying to do the dream job that that everybody kind of at some point has a fantasy about, including both of us. And I remember when I was cast in the film with Jack, I, I mean, I couldn't have been happier, but I started feeling like, what's my going to sleep dream? Like, what's that thing to f I, that I should fantasize about now? Because I just took it. It's like here. And it took me a while to find my dreaming again. I did do it, but it, it took a while. And, and if, you, if you're lucky enough to do this, and it's so hard to do, and we've, we've had kids that tried to do it for a little while and came to us and said, you know what, uh, I'm going to do something else that I can really shine at. And I respect that. And, uh, and then we have a son who's a director and a really wonderful writer-director, and I watch how hard he works and how grateful he is to do it. Um, and it's... It's just, I, I feel like people that think they can be bratty in this industry are going to not be there for long. Because the, the long haul, that might be the other thing I'm proudest of, is that at 70 and 75, we're still working as much as we've ever worked. And a lot of that has to do with just not being an asshole, you know? <laughs> And that, that's true for all of you. I mean, that's the truth about life, you yeah. know? Gratitude. Yeah. That's the key, I mm -hmm. think. You guys have both accomplished so much. What is it still on your bucket list that well, you want Well, okay. To do? I'm just the, the simple actor who just wants another role. Ask her this question, because it's kind of remarkable what happened to her. Um, yeah, I'll... I'll spare you the whole long story, but um, about 17 years ago, uh, I started writing music, and so m a lot of my goals are musical goals, you know, and um, and I really am enjoying what I'm doing and who I'm writing with, and I write a lot with people from Nashville. We write, sometimes we write country, but more often than not, we're writing songs for the end of movies, so whatever the movie is kind of impacts the Let song. me jump in and say, Critics' Choice Award for Best Song at the End of a Movie, um, it, it was uh, Wild Rose, and I encourage you to check it out, the, the end song, right? Wild Rose, did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> she, she, tied, she tied with Elton John, so. <laughs> She and your Zoe's must have been a nice a nice kind of gift for you then to kind of mix in the music with the acting. Yeah, but I, I and it was, but Zoe's was terrifying to me because <laughs> I was surrounded by musical theater people. Like talk about nerds on something. <laughs> oh my God. They you know that game, um, what's it called where you heads up. So so um 
a couple of Andrew Leeds and uh, Skylar Ashton one time <laughs> were playing heads up in the category was like musicals, musical comedies and stuff like that. And one of them, I forget who was flipping and who was guessing and giving clues, but they got to, I think it was 18 on this thing. And it was like, it was I like, you guys are freaks. But, <laughs> and... Uh, so I was working with all these people, and and that was just not. I love musicals, but I didn't have that breadth of knowledge, and I'm not a particularly. I don't write music for myself to sing. I should say, I've only sung one song I've written, and it's my love song to him. That has to be me singing, but and it's very funny, by the way. But um, <laughs> but uh, I. I'm I'm an okay singer. That's how I would describe myself. And but I'm immersed in music all the time because that's where my brain is. And um, uh, and and I've danced like only like at parties and and almost. Since we got famous, I don't even dance at parties because I'm so horrified that there's a video somewhere, <laughs> which is sort of sad. But yeah. Um, but um, so that I took that job to scare the crap out of myself. I really wanted to scare myself, and and it totally worked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so scary, but I learned so much and I enjoyed it so much. It was really a lovely experience and a great group of people, and um, and I'm so proud of my friend Alex Newell, who just um, got nominated for Tony. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I have to say, from my observation of you, that you love acting. Acting is your life, your passion, your everything. But when I see you write music, it's like you go to heaven. You're, at a dip, you're in a different sphere, you know? Uh, it's very magical. Is there ever, do you think there'll be a point where you want to focus just on one of those things and just want to write music and not act? Or do you like doing the multiple? I kind of like being greedy yeah. and just <laughs> going for, and you know, it really depends. At my age, you know, it, I'm, it's a very young business still, although you know, we always shake our heads about the book club movies, the fact that we got to make not one but two, and I'm the youngest of the cast <laughs> members. So that was uh, kind of cool. Um, but no, I don't want to make choices between things I love. I just yeah. want to get, you know, to do them as long as I can. Of course. Ted, what is the most challenging role that you've done? Wow, I always find the one I'm doing next. Um, yeah, far, I, yeah far, but Fargo, the accent, actually, and I'm not great at them, so I worked really hard, but the accent almost was like just something to hang your hat on mm -hmm. that almost gave you carte blanche. Mm -hmm. If you got the accent, you understood so much about your character. Um, I think it's so funny. I started out with the slow, dumb joke, Sam Malone. You know, and slow dumb jokes are great. Everyone else has to talk fast and set it up, and you go boom, boom, and ha, ha, ha. You know, so it's a it's a great way to go. And the older I get, I seem to be getting the and the memory is is good, but you have to work a little harder. And all of a sudden, I'm getting two page speeches, you know, in the good place or something, with very specific elevated language. Um, I don't know what the biggest challenge, uh, I, I don't know. I find them all, to some degree, have their challenges. Yeah. yeah. Damages was great. Damages was fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, when the writing is, here's the most challenging is when the writing is not great. Right. Because then you really, really, really have to work hard. Mm -hmm. And I've been, we both have been blessed with really good writing. And then you just, you know, you just say the words and let the words play you like an instrument, and it's kind of, it's kind of uh, not easy, but it's very clear and kind of effortless when the writing is great. Yeah, Mary. What the about worst for you? thing a writer can say to you is, "No, no, it's funny." <laughs> 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 uh, 
Mary, what about you? What's the, do you have a most challenging one that stands out? You know, it's probably Zoe's playlist just because yeah. for me personally, I was not, I didn't have the skill set of the people around me and I had to, I had to try to keep up. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I truly loved it for that. I hate this part of her that lo jumps yeah. off of tall buildings, you know, because I'm much more, ho, 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 you know, <laughs> kind of slowly working my way up. She just goes, whoop, boom. I'm on Valium because I love her and I can't understand how she's possibly going to pull this off, you know. And you know how you, with, when you're with someone long enough, you kind of internalize them into, so it's like, I know she's another person, but not really. She's in here. He and actually the, really means that, yeah. too. <laughs> Every once in a while, you'll catch me going, holy. <laughs> um, the worst was when she did uh, a David Mamet play, Boston Marriage, directed by David Mamet, who was like, you know, uh, he's like a conductor, man. You do every comma, pause, period, you know, everything. And it's the most verbose woman's part, I think, ever written. And they're all talking nonsense. <laughs> and I literally thought, I ran lines with you. That you started three months before you had to do it. And I remember the first time I ran lines, it was like, oh, no, 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 you can't. No, please, <laughs> don't, don't do this to the you and me, <laughs> please. And she was brilliant. Uh, before I throw to the audience, I want to ask one more thing. What is the role you get recognized for the most? Step Brothers. <laughs> it's just so good. It's just so funny. Well, it depends on the age of the child right. and parent that comes up to you, because it's Elf, or oh, then you, yeah. a little older, it's Step Brothers, or it's the parent whispering, Step Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, what about you? Well, Is, cheers, still. Of but then The Good Place brought this whole yeah. new, younger group of people. Yeah. People I th that watched was, The Good Place with their families. That yeah. was a big family show because mm -hmm. it's a, a show about, with, I mean, it's hilarious, but it has real substantive questions about morality yeah. and life and death. And people started realizing it was re a responsible and funny show that you could watch with your kids and have these amazing family discussions. And so he gets whole families come up to him about that show, but also like eight-year-old kids and 10-year-old kids. And it's very sweet. There's a, the, um, I mean, Mike Shore, who wrote it, is just Ooh. brilliant. Yeah. He's just brilliant. Uh, I mean, he's almost a savant. He really is brilliant. But they had three ethics professors on speed dial in the writer's room. They would have a, 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 an ethics professor come teach the writer's room for a week before they would start, start an episode. To the point where Notre Dame, I know, and I know other universities have done this, have, have a, a, an ethics class built around the good place. So, you know, yeah, it was really cool. It that was is really, really cool. cool. All right, I want to open it up to you guys. I know you guys have oh, so many questions. Let's Not start. this one over there. Don't. <laughs> All right. Ted's going to pick. <laughs> Let's start with you, yeah. I'm Uncle Mary. I wanted to ask you about uh, your season on Justified and working with Sam Elliott. Oh. Thank you. She's asking about my season on Justified and working with uh, Graham Yost and Sam Elliott and Tim Oliphant. Tim and I regretted that. I think we had one word to each other in the whole. I, so I played the the kind of the villain of the final season, and um, when Graham called me and asked me if I would do it, it hadn't actually been written yet. He wanted to build it around me and so I said um, well I have one requirement and he said what and I said that you give me a great death and um, then lately I heard they're doing another justified and I'm like why did I say that <laughs> uh, but he did give me a great death it's very uh, quite gruesome but and 
creepy, but um, but I loved doing that show. It was really, um, it was an amazing experience, and it's just such great writing. And Elmore Leonard was so great. He was so thrilled with that show, as you probably know, um, and they had honored him so beautifully. So I, f I felt really lucky to be asked. People don't always think of me for the mean girl parts, and I'm really good at them. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the good place when they needed to cast in some heaven sequence, the you know the most astounding human being in the world, they cast Timothy, <laughs> and, and everyone was just, oh my God, look at him walk. Are you seeing him walk? <laughs> All right, let's go over here in the front. So in addition to being great actors, you've also been very socially active. Are there particular, particular causes now that you're very passionate about? Yes. Um. <laughs> Oceana is an organization that is now the world's largest ocean advocacy group around the world. It's campaign oriented and it's about restoring and protecting the oceans, especially the world's fisheries. And um, for some reason, years ago, I, I started a small, uh, co-founded a small organization called American Oceans Campaign. And my love of oceans then was kind of naive, but then I was, we were surrounded by scientists and, and I just got more and more involved. And so it's one of the uh, great joys in my life to be around these, some of the top scientists in the world, some of the top uh, advocates and campaigners and staffs from all over the world. It's uh, a real privilege and joy to be, you know. Um, and I think that's kind of come out what celebrities, um, they, what their job is to, because you get the microphone, you know, and and that, especially when fame first hits, it's, it's like, uh, you know, when you have a five-year-old kid in the room and all the adults focus on them, that five-year-old kid will spin out, you know, just from that energy. And I think that's a little bit like being a celebrity, that you need to not just absorb everything that's coming your way. You need to deflect it into something that you care about and as long, you know, so my job was kind of, you know, thank you for watching Cheers. Uh, appreciate it. I, there's somebody I'd like you to meet, this marine biologist. She has something really important to tell you. And as long as you kind of make sure, learn as much as you can, but make sure you're passing the ball to people who can really make a difference. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I have to say that watching my husband work on the subject of helping to save the world's oceans, which is such a big part of our um, of our whole ecosystem and it, and the the planet's health, um, is one of the things I'm most in love with him about. And not just that he's done it, because people do things, and sometimes not to knock actors, but they can do, be very passionate for a year or two. And since before I knew him, and that's been 30 years, this is a self-assigned, continuous, um, very often hours and hours and hours a day working on this and even writing a book called Oceana. Um, and it it's been the seriousness and of that purpose has really been part of my love for him and and um and I agree it's just if if somebody's gonna pay attention to you, it should be partly for good reasons for all of us, mm -hmm. and also we're parents and grandparents, so we're very motivated, you know, yeah, absolutely all right, let's go toward the back the gray t shirt. Oh, I love that show. That was such a good show. Um, we only did that for two years. I it was it was weird. In the second season of that show, we somehow we got 
preempted by the basketball kind of playoffs, but like for many weeks in a row. And they just decided then on the numbers, which the numbers didn't make any sense because we weren't on the air, but they decided to cancel us. And if there were bigger reasons than that, nobody ever shared them with me. But um, it was a show that was about, um, it was very kind of uh, like the Joan Osborne song, What If God Were One of Us? So. God was sometimes a six-year-old girl, and sometimes God was the guy who delivers your mail, and you know, and it was about, uh, it wasn't preaching any religion, it was preaching, um, not preaching, it was just about a concept of how uh, people make a difference to other people. Sometimes they know it, and sometimes they don't know it. So it was really, the word ripples is really how I would boil it down to what that show is about, you know? And um, it was also about a family that had its own challenges. Jason Ritter was in a wheelchair and had been in a car accident, I think. And um, it was it was just, um, it was a great group of people, Joe Montaigne, the great, Joe Montaigne, another person as nice as this one to work with in our business. And um, and Amber Tamblin brilliantly played uh, Joan. And I was really honored to be in it. It was a really lovely show about important things. I think we probably have time for one more. Um, let's see the blue hat over here. I've seen a few times. Oh, fine. <laughs> this is us. We're very bland. Very. <laughs> you go first. I'm not doing quirks. <laughs> no, do. Do. You talk about them all the time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, now she's talking about me, talking about my quirks. No, I was. She likes to call me a hypochondriac. I like to just say I'm very interested in my body. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> there isn't a day that goes by she doesn't say, how are you? Because she sees a cloud past my face. My, 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 my shoulder hurts, you know, or my this hurts. Have we had that very same conversation this morning? Yes. <laughs> here's, here's the thing that uh, contributes to our successful relationship. We delight in each other's foibles. We delight in calling each other out and we find it very funny. So, um, yeah. Oh, she's tough. She's actually very tough. Um, can't think of one. Um, you do you. I did me. You do you. Well, I was, I, I realized. I have some. Okay. You hold it. <laughs> Duolingo, anybody? Duolingo? I think that's what you're gonna say. <laughs> It would be cheaper to fly her to Paris <laughs> and study with the best French teacher in the world than it is for her to play Duolingo. This is not an exaggeration. 12 hours a week she puts in. I do. And wow. it's not just the, you know, the, the bottom of the scale, just simple, you know, do this, do that. You can buy points if you're competing with other people to be the winner <laughs> of the week. A fortune. I like a video game only that's good for you. That's true. Also, when she was a uh, uh, music hit, Mary, overnight, it kind of like a radio station got turned on in her head. And for the longest time, I, we'd be driving together and I'd, boy, she's really pissed. She hasn't spoken to me for the last, you know, 50 miles. Um, and she'd be doing songs in her head. I never know quite where she is because she's working on lyrics or music or anything That's like that. It's not charming to you in some way? <laughs> yes, it is. <clears throat> not in the beginning. Um, we, I will also say that between us, we do have the sense of humor of 12-year-old boys. Like we're very, what's that word? Is it scatic? Scatological. Scatological, yes. Does that mean you have very low We sense love of fart humor. <laughs> We're very unsophisticated. That's why Step Brothers was like 
entering my dream world. <laughs> but she's also a lady from the South. Right. I'm a weird combination. I'm so one day a fart will be humorous. <laughs> the other day it will be disgusting. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Guys, let's give it up for Mary Sue Virgin and Ted Danson. Thank you guys so much. 